Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Happy Pi Day, Math Lovers Day, 314. So, today, we're just gonna have a chill day. I mean, we've seen most of these guitars before, but it's new amp day for me. Now, if you remember correctly, about two or three months ago, I had another new amp day when I got the 62 Chris Stapleton Signature Princeton Amp. And I had a few people like, oh, why'd you get that amp? Or I had some comments saying, are you using the new amp in this demo? It sounds fantastic. It's like, nope. <laughs> I ended up deciding that amp was just not for me. I'm one of those guys that has to have reverb built in. I don't really like using pedals that much. So I sold that one off to somebody on reverb and picked something else up, which I'm hoping will be a little bit more my style here. And so far, it looks like we lost our brown tweed, but we got another Princeton, but this one has the reverb amp and it's a 64 custom hand wired. So that's kind of what I'm going for. I like my smaller combo amps, because if I need to move these to, you know, for whatever reason, I don't want it to weigh, you know, 120 pounds like a twin reverb would be. And I've always been a really big fan of the Deluxe Reverb, but they're just not in stock on Fender's website. So I thought I would try this thing out. So Princeton Reverb Amp 64 Custom Hand Wired. Let's see if I can find our specs here. So we get a hand wired AA 764 circuit with vintage blue tone capacitors. Looks like three 12 AX7s with a 12 AT7 preamp tube, 6v6 power tubes. 12 watts of power. This is exactly what I'm looking for in an amp, I think. So we'll go ahead and uh, compare this one to my deluxe reverb that I have been using. You know, just do a quick A-B comparison. It's not gonna be a perfect comparison video, but we can do that a little bit later. It looks like these things also come with it. A pretty decent sized cover. Like there's some good padding on that. So that's always nice. But we'll put this off to the side until we unbox some guitars. Now, I'll be honest, these are all repeat guitars. We've seen them on the show before. So I won't be offended if you want to skip today's unboxing episode or just go straight to the comparison of the amp, but I do need something to play. So <laughs> let's open this one up from Sweetwater. As always, you can contact my Sweetwater sales engineer, Nate Burkhart, for all your Sweetwater needs. Or if you don't need any assistance with your purchase and just want to buy directly on their website, you can support the show by using my affiliate links. But what kind of candy did I get today? Some Laffy Taffy and a general grab bag there. But oh, where's my sticker? My daughter loves these things because I told her it says her name on it, so she always wears them around the house. But today we have one of those limited edition finishes that is exclusive to the Sweetwater family. So if you want to buy it from a different dealer, eh, you're kind of out of luck unless you find one on the used market or you want to buy mine. But this is a really attractive finish that I really liked the last time. That's why I picked up another one. So inside here sleeps. And ooh, wow, that is way nicer than the last one I had. These aren't supposed to have flame tops. So they call this one Smokehouse Burst, but it honestly has a little bit of a, what I would call a root beer flavor to it. But this one has a halfway decent flame top to it. I've I don't think I've ever seen a classic have a top like this. Wow. I was not expecting that. Maybe you can see it a little bit better in this lighting, but wow. Yeah. What I really like about this is it reminds me of like an old wooden violin or something, and it still does have a little bit of a burst. It would be even better if it had the perfect teardrop shape, but this is one of those rim bursts that I kind of do like because it's not in your face rim burst. But I think after a quick little conditioning of the fretboard, this thing will actually look really nice. It was made very early this year, the 13th day of 2021. So if you're interested in being the next owner of this nicely flamed Les Paul Classic, you can check it out on my reverb shop or buy it directly on my website. It's cheaper on my website. I don't have to charge a tax unless you're in Ohio. But for some reason, people still prefer to buy on reverb, so I just list them in both places now. I don't care where you buy it from, you still get the same guitar with the same service. And our next two ones actually kind of go together. We talked about them in the Would You Rock or Not episode of how the market is so strange on these things. It's the Captain Kirk Douglas SGs. I mean, when I tell you guys these are my favorite 
Gibson guitars that they've released so far this year that you can actually buy because they're such a great value. I truly mean it. I wouldn't, you know, buy these to have in my shop if I didn't believe that. And I did want to clarify one small thing that I said in last night's episode of how I don't view these things as being like super collectible in the future. They're still going to be desirable, like people will want to buy them used, but I think it still stands true. The original one that was limited to like 400 in production will be more valuable simply because there was less of them made. I mean, right now you can't even find these things new in store. So I kind of got lucky when I was able to pick these two up. But this is another one of the black finished ones. Whoa, do you guys see that fretboard? That is, that's one rosy fretboard. Like, wow, that is really in your face. <laughs> you know, that was kind of that one thing that I was down on about this new signature series that they could have done like rich light to make it look like an ebony, but I think rosewood was ultimately the best choice besides an ebony one. But once again, a beautiful example of this. It looks like I need to clean it up or something. I don't know what was going on there. These brand new finishes are always prone to uh, attracting all the dust and whatnot but it does appear to have arrived safely. This one's also an early one. It's a late 2020 made, 345th day of the year. And for guitar number three, let's find out what we have in here. But this one is another one of the Inverness Green. And so far on the used market, this one, the prophecy is holding true. These have better resale value. For some reason, people like these quirky out there colored ones, but this one smells very strong. Like the last one I sent to its new owner, he texted me. He's like, whoa, this thing burnt my eyes. <laughs> it's so strong. It's like, yep, when they're just finished, they do have a very strong lacquer scent to them. Like this is, woo, this is one of the most fragrant ones <laughs> that I've had, but they're fantastic guitars. So if you are interested in a Captain Kirk Douglas SG, I do have two of them available. You can check them out on my website, but I think now we need to compare my amps, see which one we want to continue to use for the channel. Cause I mean, my deluxe reverb, it's pretty good. Cause I'm still waiting on my Marshalls. I was really hoping I'd be getting them around now, but as of right now, I don't have a better estimate, but I can't wait for those things to show up too. Okay, so for the comparison here, I'm gonna use this Les Paul Classic because you know, it actually feels really nice. But I'm just gonna run through some basic tones on my original amp here, use my distortion pedal, and then we'll see if it sounds better using this newer amp or did I just waste some money and have to sell it again? We'll find out. say I really do like the Princeton reverb it sounds great with the cleans but unfortunately there's just not enough headroom for me I, the speaker keeps wanting to break up and that doesn't work well for me when I'm trying to demo the clean tones of a Les Paul 
maybe on like a strat or a telly it wouldn't be driven quite as much so i think i'm actually gonna stick with my deluxe reverb for now and just hope and pray that fender finally gets a hand wired point to point soldered deluxe reverb in stock one of these days because i really think that is what i'm after Maybe it's the 10 inch speaker of the Princeton versus the 12 inch on the deluxe. I'm not sure. I'm not much of an amp guy. I usually just buy blind, but unfortunately I just don't think I'm ready to commit to this Princeton reverb. So another swing and a miss in the new amp day, but uh, hopefully those Marshalls or the deluxe reverb when I finally get it will be good. But anyways, let's uh, fiddle around a little bit more with the Princeton. So something I notice all the way off, you don't get anything, right? But if you turn it to two, you still get nothing. It's not until about two and a half that the amp actually starts to come to life. I'm noticing this has a lot more bite and punch to it right away. Let's try to turn it up. I usually record these around like four and a half or five. treble all the way up, see how spanky it can get. That's really bright. Kind of reminds me of like some ACDC stuff. Here's where I normally have it on my other amp. Reverb all the way up. that down to about five. Now that we've had all our fun, we got a lot of backlog of packing to go through today. A couple from the Noir series, or however you pronounce it. So the Jazz Master. I didn't realize when I started this video that there was a Mexican made run. So I actually put that at the very end of the video, but most people don't watch that long, so they didn't learn that information. But the Jazz Master, in my understanding, it's the only brand new one, but they made a whole bunch of changes. So in my opinion, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the Mexican made version, but they were a lot cheaper than these guys brand new but the small little details that they changed for the Japanese run, it really brought out what these things could be. But so far, the Jazz Master sold like instantaneously and the Telecaster followed suit within about an hour. Let's pack them up. Next up, we have to say goodbye to this one. Not hard to find out what's in this case, 
my last Adam Jones signature, the one that showed up with these mystery scratches. But what well, was kind of funny, this one was initially meant to go to Australia, but I had to get this guy a different one because he didn't want the scratches. But this one, it's still ending up in Australia. <laughs> Australians love Adam Jones. Next one on the packing block is a very special R9, the Goro Yuto. Okay, so sure, it doesn't have the quilt top like most of these are supposed to have to match the anime characters, but it is an absolutely gorgeous R9. And I think for that reason, it's kind of special in its own unique way. I kind of actually wanted to keep this guitar because the more and more, you know, I looked at it, I fell in love with the color scheme, that kind of aquamarine greenish blue mixed in with this dark blue border. It's a cool guitar. As a bonus fact, Gibson actually came out with an Epiphone version of this one since the time of the review. I actually have two guitars going to the same guy. Somebody likes SGs, that's all I've got to say. So the Captain Kirk Douglas, it's the Hendrix SG. You can check out the review and demo on this one. Still not my favorite aging job in the world, but hey, kind of cool nonetheless that we have an official Hendrix Signature SG. Continuing on here, we have the Boxer Series guitar. I already packed the other one up off camera because I knew I would have to be, you know, packing them both up, so I have both of them out. It wasn't my favorite guitar in the world, but it was kind of fun how many people actually wanted to buy these. I mean, towards the end, I was getting people going, can I make like a small deposit and pay you off within a week? And I was about to go with that offer, but then, you know, within five minutes of that being sent, somebody just paid the full price, so we'll have to ship this one out. I've been getting some requests to do the uh, the Boxer Bass version, because apparently that one was more popular. There's a famous user behind it. I did not know that. However, right now, uh, Fender and I were kind of uh, working to find a good way to keep reviewing their guitars, because the way that we were doing, it's no longer working out. Next up, uh, honestly, I didn't even want to sell this guitar. I was uh, liquidating some inventory, so I did some uh, direct offers. That's something that Reverb just gave me access to not too long ago, where if you've watched my listing within the past month, I can automatically send you something. Um, I can see how that would be annoying at times, but it did help me clean up some old inventory. But, you know, I got to where I needed to be, and then, yeah, unfortunately, this one sold. <laughs> This is the Gibson Sonics prototype. I really should have kept this one, but it's okay, it's okay. I can use the money right now anyways. We'll talk more as to why I need the money in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I lost a lot of money documenting this guitar for you guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. It kind of flopped in my opinion. The Lunar Ice Silver Sky. How much did I lose? $1,400. That is insane. But, you know, the market's kind of panning out just exactly as I expected. There would be a few that would sell for good money right away, but then once they start getting released, the market will get saturated. And yeah, it's pretty much coming true that a whole $3,000 to $4,000 range. I mean, this one, it had a hard shell case. I got $4,200 in an open auction. So that tells you the market for these guys. Needless to say, next year, whatever the limited edition color is, I will not be paying a premium to document it early. Inside here is the Kenny Wayne Shepherd signature Stratocaster. You know, after hearing this guy play a little bit more, I understand why his pickups are just so bright sounding. So it, it wasn't the guitar for me as far as the pickups go. I would have replaced him with something else a little bit more traditional. But this has to be one of the most beautiful Stratocasters that was made. I mean, yeah, you got the Jazzmaster-esque neck on here. The transparent finish is pretty cool. I know the pick guard's not for everybody, but you could easily swap that out. But fun story behind this one, this was before I had my WooCommerce store set up on my website, so I accidentally uh, offered free shipping internationally on this thing. So yeah, I, I kept my end of the bargain. <laughs> Inside here sleeps the Gibson ES-275. Fantastic guitar. Was not thinking too much buying it except for, hey, it's a prototyped document. 
But, you know, when I plugged it in, it's a beautiful sounding instrument. That neck pickup sounds fantastic, both clean and dirty. I mean, the clarity of this guitar is just ridiculous. I loved it. So check out the full review and demo if you happen to have missed it. But this was uh, one of the first ones I sold directly on my website. Next, we've got the Gino Jazz Bass that I also imported from Japan. You know, Japan just gets so much cool stuff that's not available over here because they're limited editions and most people never even see these things. So I think it's great that I can showcase these things on my channel and kind of raise awareness for some of the cooler models over there. Inside this Gibson USA 90s case sleeps a Les Paul Custom. It's been a while since we've seen this, so the whole story behind this one is I got it from Japan just because I really like the top. This thing does not photograph well, but in person it's just such a gorgeous guitar. You get like kind of a mix between a flame and a quilt on this guy. It had some wear and tear, it's had a few modified parts, like one pot was replaced and you get a brass nut. But the 90s Les Paul Custom Plus tops are really cool guitars. They're some of my favorite customs that they've made. All right, troglodytes, thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.